Welcome, everyone. Aloha. Good afternoon. Aloha. Thank you all for being here. Folks on Zoom, welcome to you as well. Um, a reminder to us in the room, we are recording and uh, broadcasting over Zoom, so be mindful of our background noise. Um, for the folks on Zoom, please feel free, if you have a question, put that in the chat, and uh, Patty will bring that into the room for us and uh, be able to share that with the speaker. And so delighted that you're all here today. So. Um, my name is Thomas Dalbert. I probably know most of you. I don't know who all is on Zoom, but um, I'm the executive director of the Friends of Hawaii Wildlife Refuges, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our Prince of Mo'olelo series, uh, which is uh, developed in sponsorship with our partnership of the Friends Group and our good friends at the Prince of Hanalei Community Association, giving us this space here today, as well as the Zoom broadcast. We have the illustrious Patty behind the camera today. Thank you so much, Patty. She is, uh, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. The more modest, the more, the more class you get. So that, that's the way that I feel. So uh, she is an amazing volunteer and board member for both our organization and um, so on. Um, so speaking of volunteers, another incredible one. And thank you so much, Patty. We appreciate it. Um, I believe we're speaking to a lot of friendly faces already who know us, but just to keep it consistent. So we are, of course, the Friends Group that helps support the three national wildlife refuges, which we'll hear more about through Kathleen's presentation today. We as a Friends Group are really honored to support in any number of ways. Essentially, we show up by saying, what do you need and how can we help to our beloved partners at the refuges? And we're so honored to be a gateway for the generosity of our, our community to help support the mission and the wildlife that needs us so much. We have a few uh, constant programs that we uh, continue to help underwrite and support in that vision. Um, in particular, the support of our, our birds themselves, uh, maintaining and, um, the restoration of these special places. One that's very dear to my heart is uh, we fully underwrite the cost of all of the birds that are sick or injured on any of our uh, properties, uh, refuges that get transferred to save our shearwaters. Blessings to save our sheer waters, our dear friends, and uh, we are able to be part of that lifeline of support for, for the wildlife and for our refuges who uh, need our, our financial support to help make that life getting care possible. So very proud of that, as well as educating tomorrow's environmentalists, the littles through field trips and free buses, all the way up to scholarships for young people um, who are in college pursuing conservation-based careers. So any number of ways that we plug in consistently, um, as well as with just staffing and final financial resources to fill in the, the puka in the programs of our dear partners at the Fish and Wildlife. So um, number of ways you can uh, support us in this work, which is all of what we're here today to talk about, but of course, visiting us, shopping our nature store, uh, volunteering, donating, and plugging into our communications. If you're not already on our email newsletter list, there's a list in the back, and Kathleen will use that list as well for volunteer inquiries that might come from the room, but um, I put together a monthly newsletter that I'm really pleased to be able to share information with about once a month, and if you're not already receiving that, it's a great place to hear in particular about upcoming volunteer activities and opportunities. So I would encourage that. For the folks on Zoom, there's a button on our website as well. You can plug in to receive it there as well. And just like to give one little quick shout out to each, each month to one of the amazing species across our refuge. And of course, this is the time of year when these sweet little puff balls of love are popping out all over Kilauea Points. The Oahuakani or Wedgetail Shearwaters um, are in their burrows all around Kilauea Points. There are a number of really great opportunities right around the visitor center, which my team and I staff, um, and they'd be happy. Tina is here today as one of our illustrious sales associates who'd be happy to talk story with you out of Kilauea Point about these cute little sweethearts. Um, it's amazing to witness that just after uh, about 48 hours, they are left by the, on their own while the parents start to go out and forage for food. And so the delicate nature of them, but the incredible resiliency as well, just close observations of nature are an incredible, incredible thing. And we have an opportunity to watch these sweet animals from egg to fledge. And it's a really beautiful opportunity. And that's part of what Kinley Point is all about. So with that, a quick shout out as well to the, uh, the, the next couple of segments in our series of uh, the Mo'olelo series. Next month, we're going to have a presentation from Jacqueline Nelson, who is a member of the Save Our Shoe Waters team. 
we'll be heading into the beginnings of the, the fledging season for the two different species of shear waters. And so it's a really great time for us to um, increase our knowledge of what Save Our Shear Waters does in particular for those target species, but also for the support they offer to all of the native wildlife that they help support. And then in October, uh, Bill Epsilon um, is going to speak to us about the many impacts of the Monsanto product. So we uh, much to get educated about there and a uh, really interesting conversation, very knowledgeable and a lot of research. And I think it's gonna be a really interesting one to tune into. So that'll be, um, we'll be shifting that one to a Tuesday. So we're gonna test that as well to see in addition to Sunday afternoons and evenings during the week also are good or maybe even better in terms of making sure that we have great attendance. It looks great. We appreciate all of you being here, but so that one will be on Tuesday in October. With that, I get to introduce today's speaker. Most of you probably know her, but I am very happy to share that she began, uh, Kathleen Viernes, Kath began her career with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service at the Kauai National Wildlife Refuge Complex in 1988. Mm -hmm. And she has worked at all three refuges in a variety of capacities, including conducting habitat management and restoration, biological monitoring, environmental education, visitor services programs, volunteer management, and of course, anyone in a brown shirt, much, much more. Um, <laughs> uh, she also spent eight years working in administration and public outreach with our uh, organization and the Friends Group. And that's how I first had the pleasure of getting to know and working alongside Kathleen. And I got to learn so much about our wildlife and our history by working alongside her. It was such a treat. And I'm so delighted that life evolved that all of her knowledge and her passion got to stay with our refuge and she shifted back to her brown shirt. Mm -hmm. um, Kathleen delights in helping others cultivate a kinship with nature through meaningful outdoor experiences especially through conservation volunteers, and that's what we get to talk about today. So my distinct pleasure, welcome Kathleen, and thank you again all for being here. Thank you. Hi, big mahalo to Thomas, just an amazing director of our site for a week, and not function without them, so much support. Uh, and besides just as a French group director, also a very avid volunteer as well. So, um, and also thank you to all of our current volunteer directors support and answer questions for folks um, who might have them direct from the horse's mouth. Even though I've also been a fish and wildlife volunteer here, um, it's nice to have a variety of voices and people doing different kinds of work with us. So after we kind of move through our PowerPoint, uh, people have questions or they want to, you know, you volunteers want to pipe up with some story, we'll do good ones. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, we're just going to jump in. I don't think this is going to take too long. I want to just have a lot of time for questions and just exploring and wandering around the, the world of volunteering with us. Um, but my first most important thing is the wildlife refuges on Kauai, they are your lands, right? They're as important and you own them. We're federal government. Wildlife refuges are part of the federal system under the Department of Interior. And um, they are your public lands, even though you can't get into all of the places all of the time, everywhere. They're definitely, you, you're stewards of them, whether you're actually working on them or not, because your taxes go towards, you know, supporting um, wildlife refuges. All right, we're just going to jump in. And by, you know, coming out and actually putting your hands on the plants and the dirt and birds out there, you're definitely making a difference. We'll, we'll go into a little bit why too, but um, like Thomas said, it'll feel a little bit like a to the choir, but there's uh, people in here who I don't know, so we'll just make sure we got everything bases covered. But the Kauai National Wildlife Refuge Complex is a group of three wildlife refuges. Um, the signs are up behind us, but some of the highlights, first of all, Hanalei was the very first one. A lot of people think Kilauea Point is because there's this historic white house there. Actually, Kilauea Point was the last one on board officially, but um, Hanalei was established in 1972. And um, both it and the next one that we'll show you slide up was primarily to protect and uh, create safe habitat as a breeding habitat for endangered water birds. And Nene came along um, in the process of that a little bit later on. Um, provides critical nesting and feeding habitat. There are also uplands. A lot of people look at Hanalei and just think, oh, that's all wetlands, but there are upland habitat areas as well. If you ever hiked up the Polyhaw Trail, 
uh, that the public can get into. Part of that is on the wildlife refuge. Um, there's also some cultural spaces. There are some hay outs up on the hills up there that, that have been um, documented and explored by historic folks in the federal birds. Um, so, Honolulu is well known for all the hollow fields, right? The hollow patches or logi. Um, those have been there long before it was ever one of refuge. And when Honolulu came on, that practice, that agricultural farming practice stayed because it is a way to help manage the wetlands. If the federal government said, okay, all that's got to go, we're just going to do this naturally. It's never naturally when you're making rectangular ponds and mowing and disking, that's what you have to do for things, is um, those farmers really help us keep wetland spaces open, uh, provide nesting and feeding habitat for water. So the farmers on there have to go through, they have to comply with certain rules that are different than color farmers off refuge. Um, we have requirements of them to help boost it and to make it even more safe and productive for the birds. So there's a few things that they have to agree to in exchange they get a very good rate for being on refuge and farm there. Um, <clears throat> very intricate irrigation system that began with the Hawaiians when they first dug ditches and created gravitational irrigation flow. Uh, since that time, especially in fish and wildlife became part of it, there have been irrigation system upgrades and you know, after blowout, in fact, our friends group had a um, had a great apply for a grant that helped with restoration after major flooding. So that's all part of it. And the cultural significance, of course, uh, Kalo is super important to Hawaii. That is the base, you know, kind of the foundation for um, Hawaiian culture. It's the elder brother right, of, of the Hawaiian people. So it has a super important cultural significance. In addition, after Kalo, rice came along down there and there was a whole period when white rice was grown. Uh, down in Honolulu. So there's quite a bit of history about that too. The Haraguchi Rice Mill, um, there's still a nonprofit organization, the Haraguchi's have that educate people about the history of rice in the valley. Okay, and very exciting, um, the viewpoint that is coming soon, right down the road across from here is a brand new um, viewpoint that's been worked on for Oh my gosh, a very long time is all I'm say. But it's opening soon. <laughs> and it allows people to have a safer place to drive into, park their car, spend time. Everybody's used to pulling off on the highway there. It's so dangerous. And the more people on the side of the more traffic the busier it gets, the more dangerous it gets. So for many, many years it was discussed that we need an alternative. And that is finally going to have its maiden flight very soon. <laughs> and um, it'll be up to the public. And I'll talk a little bit about, when we're going through the volunteer jobs, what, um, what an opportunity there's going to be for there. OK, so Hanalei, first refuge. Lots of opportunities now we'll talk about when we get there. Hulaiia, hardly anybody knows about Hulaiia. Little refuge, you know, 241 acres. If you're standing in Lihui and you know, found your way to the overlook that says many Huni fish ponds, it's mm -hmm. kind of on the back way overlooking the Lihui stream. Um, that, if you look down and you saw the fish pond and then you look to the right, hardly recognize it a little bit more now, but that is um, a wetland refuge that was brought on board to the refuge system just a year after Honolulu. So um, when I was working with the state biologists on some Nene stuff, and we were down at Papua he said, you know, there's this reference, and I have to find it, but he never did. And it was an old, old reference that talked about the sky being black with ducks down there, you know, a long, 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 long time ago. So of course, all our endangered water birds are not going to fill the sky and make it black, especially our koloa. But there is potential down there to create and improve habitat and upper population numbers for our endangered water birds. So it too provides critical nesting feeding habitat. Um, whereas Hanalei gets seen, people can even drive down the road right beyond it. You can hike and see it from above. Hulei'i is pretty much blocked off. So there's the Hulei'i stream on one side, called a river, it's technically a stream, but big. And then there's, um, one gate into the refuge. And there are some people that border that live along the edge, but it's really not well known, but still an important place on that side of the island. 
Um, also manage wetland ponds. There's no hollow down there. There was in the past. Hollow certainly used to be grown down there. But all that was banned for many, many years. When I first came on, there were cattle grazing all over there. You could walk through without going on the big cow hummocks through the wetlands. Um, and then, as I said, adjacent to the, what people call the Minnehaha fish pond is Ali Coco fish pond. Actually, you know, Coco. It's been Ali Coco. I think the most recent name is Ali Coco. We are going to be, I think, I think the game is going to be up pretty soon for Huleia because the fish pond is, uh, there's a nonprofit working there now. There's a lot of restoration going on, a lot of education. There are neighbors, so there's going to be some partnering and some educational overlap in there. So I'm really looking forward to Huleia coming into it. Well-deserved, you know, anniversary is coming up pretty soon, right? 1973, it's this year. So we'll be celebrating um, its anniversary. Okay, and then a lot of people know, right? Kilauea Point is probably the one that everyone thinks of if they're thinking of a wildlife refuge up why? Because you're coming out, it's a lighthouse, beautiful. I think it's kind of focused here, but the refuge goes all the way up and over and it extends up to that little point of land. Uh, don't you know that? Uh, originally, it was about a 30 acre parcel where the lighthouse is and the lighthouse keepers. When I um, came on with the refuge in 88, so this became a refuge until 1985. And the um, Fish and Wildlife Service had a present there because their staff that was working down at the newly acquired Honolulu and Hulaia refuges would live on at here. So Fish and Wildlife had a presence there, it was more of an administrative site. It wasn't being a wildlife refuge. Uh, nobody, it was just Coast Guard was giving it up. It was a federal land. It was perfect and convenient to come away. And, you know, in time, the biologists were there. They started saying, oh my gosh, this is an incredibly important place and seabird sanctuary, you know, for the future. That were not recognized as any of the native species in the focus at that time was really getting wetlands into protection. So little by little, the community, the biologists were recording things, even though it wasn't a refuge yet. Uh, in 85, that first 31 acres was actually turned into a wild refuge. Following that over the year, the refuge moved to look at all those other parts. So that, that extra acreage off to the east was important too. And as developers get, getting ready to develop, um, there was a push by the community. And we can really, really, really thank the community for the foresight and the diligence and the insistence and, and the many people who work together to get the refugees and to be telling it's um, it's full size of 199 acres now. Actually, it's maybe a little more to the sunset five. So anyway, and when this refuge came on board, the focus was to be able to have it be a uh, protection for the birds. Uh, at that time, there were no many on the refuge that didn't happen until the early 90s. So although they're a big part of it now, the they didn't come on board until the um, captive piece up there in the um, early 90s. But it was all about educating, because there was an understanding that people who, you know, all these seabird colonies are out in the Northwest and the Hawaiian Islands are going and you really have a hard time getting people to grasp what the importance of that is when they can't get on a plane and go out to the They can't get on a plane and go out to the show. So this was a way of bringing that education to the people on a, in a way that they may not be able to get. On all the other islands, we have mongoose, so mongoose on Kauai, so they're actively, you know, nesting good reproduction of seabirds, even though they've got some issues and predators, uh, not nearly as bad because of the lack of mongoose. So this was an opportunity to have wildlife education, to bring that right to the public, including school groups. We'll talk a little bit about that and talk about jobs you can do. And then also the lighthouse, of course, the historic lighthouse is there. It's a way to be able to do interpretation about the whole history of that. And then of course, managing habitat and wildlife um, to as a conservation point. So it had a, it had a, um, a little bit more multi pronged because of the public use, and it was definitely not going to be cut off to the public. When I first came in 1982, I joined the annual show, I to call it, and you could drive your car out there, and the gate was always open, and nobody ever, barely ever, went out to the lighthouse. Like, How would you drive out there? There's nothing out there. And um, 
And then, and then over time, even before it became a refuge, it was being habitat was being restored to native plants, and you know it's been a journey to get there. It looks nothing like it looked. Pretty amazing. Okay, so those are the three places where you could go play. All right, who volunteers? Find yourself in my closet. <laughs> no one's everyone is in there. Maybe. Um, she was here for a short time helping, but she's the daughter of Dan Moriarty, who was really the first refuge manager and who was passionate about native plant restoration at a time where they actually were about four different native plants that were out there. So, you know, collecting off the cliffs and good, good friends with the Robinsons on the other side were also really mm -hmm. into sort of native plant restoration. Um, but we've got young people, more life experienced people, <laughs> men, women, kids. Although I'm really kind of appealing to you today as individuals who are going to come. We have a lot of volunteers who show up for one of us. We have a lot of school groups that come in and help. We have traveling groups from the mainland that might be service groups. So um, when I show a number pretty soon, we're going to have volunteers going, exactly. And it's including all the hands that maybe came out, even if it's a one off. So, um, in all these different possibilities that you can be, and you, if they have one, because we will write a job description for it if you need it. I promise you that. If you have something to bring that would be a contribution, we are completely amenable if it's a need to to getting that up as a job description. We had a guy hunting bullfrogs, two people hunting bullfrogs. That was not a normal job description. So um, they went out there because they were bullfrog catching experts and they helped us remove bullfrog. It's not a lane that can just suck down chicks of native um, heritage water. So lots of opportunities, okay? All right, so who volunteered and what are they doing? In FY22, that's why I said somebody's getting off. <laughs> um, really, about half of those are regulars. Well, actually, less than that. So, if you've got about 50, well, you know, uh, third of them. So, we've got about 50 throughout the year, and people come and go, and they may be seasonal, but about that many who come back year after year. And even if they're only here for a few months helping, or some of them are here six weeks, but they're regulars, and they keep coming back. And, and um, that, that's very well, but 5,500 hours of work. Um, and this is work that wouldn't be that you know often just cannot get done by our staff. So I just am astounded at how if, if all our volunteers tried out today, I think every staff person would freak out <laughs> because there's no way we could get done what we get done without that help. Absolutely not. Okay, so something for everybody. You bet, job. You know, this guy, he's been <laughs> over there. Yeah. So, so we have road interpretation. That's an activity that right now currently is really just for Kilaway Point because we're open, right? Wednesday through Saturday, the public comes in. We do not have the staff to have rangers posted out all day long doing that interpretation. So we absolutely rely on roving interpreters. And one of the things, um, one of the super important jobs that is part of that, besides educating the public, answering the questions, inspiring them to care about the environment, our Hawaiian uh, wildlife, our habitat, but in a, even a bigger, broader sense, which is, you know, you have a wildlife friend with probably right here, you can go, go find out about that. So even expanding the word out and being aware beyond our own uh, refuge complex is bringing that awareness to other people that, you know, you can go find that on a map and go visit. But is, um, we have folks that come out who cannot walk out to the rep, out to the point. So we have the golf cart service, right? Put them in a golf cart, take them out. We it was just we would not be able to do that service without our volunteers out there every day doing that for for folks. And and it's a super super important one. So and although we don't have it now, lighthouse, um, we were doing for a long time doing lighthouse tours. So adding that component of education to folks deepening, we've got a lot of 
you know, self-guided information out there, but there is nothing better than having, like, Cheryl, you've done those, Tana, you've done those, Julie, did you used to? No. Uh, I don't know if Tom did. But there's nothing more impactful than having a person who's sharing their passion about the lighthouse and where people can ask a question and get that one-to-one. -one. So, you know, since COVID, that all, that all stopped and we haven't opened those up again. And the word of from above is yes, we do want to do that. Yes, we will be having lighthouse tours. However, it's going to be structured so that there's an efficiency to do that. And we have not figured out a way practically, given our, that we now have 45 minutes time visits for people to come to the refuge in their time slots, how to make this all work. So, you know, in light of, you know, a, a lot of other hills to climb, stuff that one has not. That one has not been solved yet, but it is the intent to have that. Okay, um, native habitat restoration, we're kind of shifting over to calling it habitat management now, um, only because there is, you're not sometimes always working with the native, sometimes it really is just managing, managing the weeds, and it's not all replanting in every place, it's just keeping the jungle back, um, and it's a little bit broader name, so you might see that shift in the next bit, uh, and that can be, um, Mostly that's been going on at Kilauea Point. Occasionally we've been down at Kulia. Tom, you did that, removing cattail. And um, at Honolulu, less so, but it will become, I think it's going to become a little bit more of Honolulu perhaps in the future. But we'll certainly be having a need up here at the Point because there's been a lot of native plants put in, a lot of um, areas set up, and it's already getting overgrown. It's, you know, the intent to open that was a while ago. Um, so you can play with the power tools if you want. <laughs> um, this year, uh, as I was saying before, kids are volunteers and work alongside school kids if they want to. They can, um, you know, Margaret is an amazing, she moved back to the mainland, but she's an amazing uh, volunteer who. Tom, you and her kind of were probably our, our longest working for free uh, volunteer, and he's there holding the, holding the, holding the space still. And um, so much knowledge that she gained. She came in not really knowing anything about native plants and left here with so much knowledge. And when other habitat workers would come in and work with her, she just infused that. We just don't have staff to really put in a lot of one-on-one -on -one time, and our volunteers are super important at mentoring other volunteers. So it's um it's a system that's worked and it's just invaluable. Um, you get to get out to places. The so lighthouse is over here. Public lives there, but these folks are working at a place that's called Mollyville. Um, and so you get to get into places that other people don't get to get into. And um, that's kind of fun. You're going to see things that other people don't see. And, Experience, um, it's pretty cool stuff. It's part of the privilege of, of um, working with her. All right, nursery, our native plant nursery. Oh my gosh, since I've been, since I first started there in the 80s, there's always been a nursery. It's gone through different iterations, ups and downs, shrunk, expanded. Um, there's going to be another new, brand new native plant nursery down at Honolulu Lake uh, this year. There's funding for that. So uh, this has played a really important, it's not only beginning when, when there weren't really anybody growing native plants out for us to just, for Fish and Wildlife to go say, oh, I'll put in my order for, you know, 200 Kohinahina and 50 Nopaka. And so when it was first going on, when I was there in 88, we were collecting and processing seeds and everything that got planted on the refuge came from what was propagated at the refuge in the greenhouse. So um, since then, there is the National Park botanical garden. Um, there's an amazing team there and they grow all kinds of stuff. But sometimes we get plants from there and it's good. We shake it up a little bit. This year we had a cuckoo intern who was like whatever the Hawaiian version of Johnny Appleseed is. That <laughs> one man, oh my gosh, he brought in a whole, you know, each five or ten years we get an influx of different species of plants and we'll plant them out and try them, what works, what doesn't. And he just brought in a whole new kind of slew of native plants and really expanded the table, table of native plants. And um, I swear, he could get anything to grow. 
So with that, it took 11 months to stop, but he has passed on that knowledge. And that is all part of what you, if you're going to work in the nursery and had zero experience, it doesn't matter. You can walk in with no experience. Somebody's going to be there to guide. We've got handbooks, we've got, um, you know, uh, directions, all kinds of guidance for you, your staff, and other volunteers. Um, nobody has to be an expert in anything. You come in at the bottom of the learning curve, and there's nowhere to go but <laughs> All right, let's see. Okay. Oh, and part of part of the nursery is that um, these are all nursery books, and you don't have to just be like, oh, I'm in the nursery, in the greenhouse, and I'll be in there. You're welcome to jump out, and sometimes the nursery needed to get the greenhouse needed to get plants put out, and they would ask, and so the nursery team can be just as much part of the habitat maintenance team as well. You can do whatever you want with us. <laughs> okay, and environmental education. Let's see. Raise your hand in here if you're volunteering. Oh, you've done that. Um, oh. Oh, yay. <laughs> um, uh, so that's a piece that is a little bit different than being a roving interpreter because you're actually working with the school groups uh, and we have a very specific program for third grade called the Albatross Life Cycle Program. It is geared for the learning standards for third grade and so it's a very well created program and it includes uh, classroom work, paperwork, and then volunteers going into the classroom, as well as volunteers helping with the field trips. Uh, when the kids come out, because they have several, several field trips that they get to do um, when they come out. And then they have an end project at the end to do something. So it's a big full circle education program. And the kids love it. They don't forget their lessons from it. They're super excited to be out there. Um, and so that's the apple truck life cycle. It includes being able to take the parts of the cold bolus. Mm -hmm. So that's a pellet that albatross mm -hmm. erp up, you know, before the chicks, the erp up before they leave on Monday, just in there. And they get to like go through that and look and see what's inside it, squid bees, the plastic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a little safety, so that always adds to the fun of it. And those are recompacted, right? Like their most materials are reused and, mm -hmm. and it gets to be part of that. Um, and then, so this is Elise. He actually was a uh, retired teacher who really was instrumental in forming up this with, with our educators and forming that whole program. So uh, this was one of those cases. He's really had the desire that we fully volunteer and let it handle with minimal staff input because she knew how, how scarce our education staff was. It, Everybody at our refuge does multi jobs, and, and we will see a few rangers are all fee collectors too. So, being able to have volunteers is such an instrumental part of that, and really carry the ball was her intent, and it's been amazing. It really has worked out that way quite well. Um, and then we do have other, you know, like the Elder Trust Life, Life Cycle Program that's here for third grader. There's our others programs where a school might call up and they really want to have their you know, eighth grade come out for a field trip, or they're coming from off island. Uh, we have what used to be called the Elder Hostel. It's now called Rhodes Scholars. And Rhodes Scholars are really waiting. <laughs> uh, but they'll come out with enough of a group, and you know, they will often request for some kind of a, um, an education support that can do it. So, you know, that education can be everywhere from preschool up to um, taking a, an adult group. And then when we have service groups of high schoolers, we always incorporate an educational aspect to that. So lots of opportunities. If you don't want to be committed to doing the life cycle program, you could still come on as an uh, EE, environmental education volunteer, and um, you know do other parts of it. And sometimes maybe you don't feel comfortable in a classroom, but you're willing to come and do a field trip. You might learn about the whole program and opt for part of it. So lots of possibilities for that. Okay, wildlife monitoring, biological monitoring, a few names of this. Yeah. <laughs> um, and this this has been more the, the big one with this is the avian botulism. So that's come on board. Avian botulism is a disease that um, has run through Honolulu. It's deadly for our endangered water birds. The trick to managing it is to getting the sick 
and dead birds out of the system, getting their dead body purpose is protein source out so you can break the cycle. We'll go into that whole long thing, but just know that it's a disease that um, wasn't always on the refuge and it kind of bloomed up. Uh, I think there's plenty of letters when it really started becoming a regular issue. And it goes up and down in terms of its intensity and severity. And right now, we're not good in a, in a pretty mellow place with it. But at any time when it starts happening, there's a need to follow it. And even though we're in a low, mellow place with it, uh, we have avian bunches and volunteers out there pretty much every day of the week mm -hmm. covering all these and more, walking the banks of these, doing um, bird surveys. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to be a bird expert. You're going to get the training to be an avian botulism so like survey person, and you will learn how to identify the birds. You'll learn, learn to, you know, you'll get your little kit. And you're going to pick up that thing. So you just you have to not be too weemish or, you know, be willing to, to get over. It can be stinky and wet and rainy. So that is um, that is one possibility. We have um, Cheryl company. Sometimes we have these periodic counts like the um, annual Nene count that the state does all over the state. So when that happens on our refuge, we try to count every Nene from all our refuges and that takes teams of people. So volunteers will come along and help with those at times. And then we also currently have no biologists and no biotech staff on right now. Um, Never ever in my life. <laughs> so I need to get going. Okay, so, uh, we have volunteers who've been doing this alongside biologists in the past, at work, have been here a long time. Uh, Yuka and Louise Bo have done have done the um, avian botulism surveys down in LA, but they started helping staff. And now with no staff, they basically are the ones who, and Patty, you help with that, and Thomas is helping that. So we're starting to grow a little bit bigger of a team so that we're not just dependent on these two volunteers because when Louise runs off to Midway to do this work, um, like that albatross monitoring well, Midway, we want to make sure that we have um, volunteers who can, who are trained and can do it. So again, these are two volunteers who mentor other new um, onboarding volunteers who are going to do this. That kind of work is a little bit trickier because you're going into areas without staff that are really, now we're talking over the hill on mobile a point and greater hill. So you need to learn the areas, it's more physical, and everybody wants to get this close to an albatross. And um, they're not handling the birds, they're just recording and recording nesting and um, hatching success, fledging success. And it is such important information. And have, were, would we not have them gathering it, there would be this big, huge, Cool in what we have because there was intense monitoring when the birds first started nesting on the refuge. And it was, I came in 88, they were already monitoring it. First attempts in 1976, not so good. Refuge expanded. There was attraction in 82 and 83 to bring the albatross to the point where the lighthouse not there, but it was only hill right nearby. And um, so every bird was banded every year. The crew nested with each other was meticulously recorded. Because you're talking about maybe 20 birds, 20 pairs, for a very small. Um, it's grown now over time, but the needs of the biologists are to focus on endangered, threatened and endangered species. Um, Lisa and others are not threatened or endangered. Um, but there's this scientific, you know, in me that says we can't lose, we don't want gaps in, in the, where this is so important. It's, it really was a new colonizing albatross colony. It's hard to, it's hard to grab that midway, they've been nesting their whole everywhere. So how do you capture and kind of track what happens when a new colony is forming? So that, you know, kind of start on its own and knowing a little help with bird decoys and voices, we attract them to a place where we'd like them to be and can safely manage. So that information without volunteers doing it right now, um, there would be huge gaps in the data. And so for me, having worked on those nest counts in 88 on and it's all up to 97. I'm so grateful that even if our biology team can't do it because it's not at a high enough priority level for fish and wildlife to say, no, no, you go count albatross and let the endangered water birds, you know, die on all that's not going to happen. So again, super important. 
and skilled, it's a building of a skill. They've learned it along the way, alongside staff, or anything like that. Um, and then we have exportable water accounts. So even if you want to be in the wetlands and the efforts, and you don't um, can't commit to a weekly walk around your trickle patch um, area for an hour or two, you could say, hey, I really like birds. I would like to help with your quarterly water bird counts or your nanny count. You just, you know, we then you join us and that was when we learned how to do that. Okay, avian transport. I have a new inductee. <laughs> first in her first, she said, I want to do that. And within what four days or so less than a week? The following day. Following day, <laughs> we had a sheer water that needed to be transported. And um this job is not it's not a frequent flyer sort of deal because it's super hit and miss. Like we might not have a bird that needs transport for months, and then we'll have one that needs to go. And avian transport is basically that um, we have a volunteer who, you know, there might be um, a botulism bird that's been given its injection by the staff, but it needs to go to SOS and save our share waters. This is where Thomas was talking about the fully underwrite the recovery. So all the birds from the refuge, they will um, get treated if need be. And this is in the field because the faster you get an inject an antitoxin to it, botulism bird, the more likely they'll live. Then it goes back to the office for a little bit and gets assessed. And then it, the call goes to a volunteer. Hey, we have a bird. Can you get it to SOS? Because once it gets to the same or share water folks, who are the rehabbers, they are the experts. We, you know, staff does triage and SOS does saving, hopefully. That's the goal. And then sometimes they won't even have like <laughs> and you know, an albatross, it looks like it's in prison, but <laughs> it's going for help. So it could be anything from a duckling to a bird in a cage. You don't have to handle the bird, right? You stick it in your vehicle. You just have to keep it quiet and cool. You can't blast clean or the radio going. You can talk soft, soft, and you didn't want to be encouraging me to it, but it's mostly going to be very dark and quiet on its journey. Uh, SOS is now, they used to be up in the Humane Society, um, is, they used to be up there, but they have moved up to Wailo Homestead, so they're kind of closer to the North Shore, uh, and you kind of weave your way up to, I don't know if anybody knows where the Arboretum is up there, it's mm -hmm. a little bit before there's a, the uh, State Agriculture Station, so they have their house with there now. But it's a little bit closer to us, it makes it a little bit easier. Sometimes staff on those birds, they have poo, poo interns if they're available. Uh, and then we have this little, you know, kind of a list of people who said, just call me whenever you need a bird transported. It might need to come from Hanalei, it might need to come from Kilauea Point. Rare that it would be from Kulaea because we're not really doing much down there. So. Yeah. All right, nobody's going to ask you to stick a needle in a bird, I promise, <laughs> or put a tube down. It's really just transport. Okay, maintenance and carpenter. These jobs so far have been really kind of one-offs, except for um, our lighthouse. He's like, there, you know, the, this guy is handing the key off to this guy. And he was a main lighthouse keeper. He just liked to do it. He would go in and every week, because the lighthouse, we're not open to the public, but when we were, it needed to be cleaned and wiped down. It's a salty environment and it's a historical building. So if you don't, sometimes there's leaks and you gotta wipe up water. So every week now, John who took over that job. He's almost coming down. Um, he goes in on a Monday. It has the lighthouse. He goes in there, cleans, keeps it all beautiful, and he's like a many many. The baby hardly sees them. Well, visitor services staff don't because our schedule is Tuesday through Saturday. But there are other staff there on Monday, and he's. Completely self-directed. He he learned the deal. He knows what he has to do. He goes in and he does it. And then he reports his hours. So uh, if he has questions or he needs something, then he reaches out. But he really is quite and he's happy to be he's just happy to be out there on a day when nobody's out there. And he takes pride in the work that he's doing. He's invaluable because our staff can barely keep with, up with the other things we have to clean. So so it's a super cool niche thing that's really easy and help for him to just take out. Um, this is one of our snowbird volunteers, and we had a knee, we had a big albatross to play, but every day we didn't worry about it. So we asked them to build us a rolling platform. So much easier, so awesome. There are many jobs that are um, 
like our head maintenance person, Stephen, would probably love to have people helping out with. So you come in with a scale and say, hey, I can paint, I can carpentry, I can fix motors, I can, and I promise you that we can put it work. Yeah, I can mow big fields. I've been on heavy equipment, so um, there might be a training that would be offered to you if you're going to do that. This guy here, Tom, he does everything. Native plants, he mows, he does roving interpretation, and uh, and this is what I'm finding from many of our volunteers. They they you know come for this job, and then they start to gather up into their heart and their arms all the amazing extra job that they want to do. All right. So this is the Avian botulism survey. Talk about it a little bit. You go out, and the teams are not. It's my son. I found told him and his girlfriend. They yeah. got help. And they're low. They're COVID. <laughs> and then they totally got into it. So um, you walk the dikes. You're looking for dead and sick birds. You might get your nose. Um, if you find, you would call a staff person. Your phone. I've got a dead bird. I'm like, getting ready to go to the office, and they will come out. And in this case, it's probably a dead bird because it's a plastic bag. But um, they will get it back to the office and do what they need to do for triage and go on the SOS. And then you can carry on with finishing your survey. Um, the biggest, um, probably the most vulnerable of the birds um, is the Poloa, upper and major mm -hmm. water birds. So they're they're all over there in the back. So have a look when you when you head out. But um, all the endangered water birds are home. Any birds are Opuu, which is a black crowned eye heron, not endangered, but indigenous. An egret could get sick. But the nature of their feeding and their style and the way that botulism perpetuates, they're the most vulnerable. And they're also our our Poloa, our native Poloa, are being hybridized in other parts of the state, right? So if somebody brought in mallards to have around hotels years ago, not really thinking. And our, they started hybridizing with our native flow. So having a pure native flow strain, they were starting to get diluted. You see these kind of mud ducks over on the block. this like a mallard, And when they started doing testing, they found that Kauai was the cleanest of all those. And Kauai also shut down the mallard situation pretty quick. When it was starting to be understood what was happening. So you you can't tell somebody they can't do it. Don't understand that, but you can't. But there's a lot of education to try to get um, farmers and landowners that have ponds to not take another kind of duck, don't bring in mallards. Um, and and Honolulu in particular has a very there was a lot of studies done by uh, Chris Malkowski, who's a grad student doing DNA testing, and uh Honolulu in particular is that not really, it's very clean, it's not really hybridization going on. So it's super important that we keep that place. Uh, it's kind of like a, you know, a, a four C port or what could happen if we want to try to transplant um, pure non-hybridized below or somewhere else. Anyway, so they are the main vulnerable ones and they are, even though we're looking out for everybody, that's a big one that we get concerned about. The die-offs happen, they're probably the most mm -hmm. Okay. So you do, you might get your feet wet, even if you're not stepping into the edge of a pond, you're probably walking through wet grass, it's usually a morning job, you know, maybe an hour to two hours. Um, next level is our detector dog program, and this is another super cool thing that volunteers did. So detector dogs, um, in this case, they're dogs that are trained to smell um, thick or dying or dead birds. And the whole point of walking around as humans to do this is to get them out of the system. So dog noses are way better. There was a study that was done to determine is this really a good idea, it's worth it, the training, and um, the dog's ability to find birds that humans miss was like 100% better. Mm -hmm. So way, way exceeded what a human could do. And it's understandable. You're talking about a, a you know, a call of touch like that. There's no way you're going to see into the middle of that. The best you can do is get the stuff at the edges. Maybe you smell, maybe you want to wrap, but the dogs are just invaluable for doing this. And you know, dogs can be trained to smell out, be sniffers for all kinds of things. I mean, uh, and in this case, they go through a training program. It's a little bit more rigorous when you have to have a dog, but they do not have to be. Here's, um, these are Deborah Bowcrosses, two dogs. 
And, um, you know, she's an Aussie lover and she used to do, uh, what do you call rescue? Like wilderness people lost. Rescue. Yeah, search and rescue. Yeah, search and rescue. And um, she shifted more into doing this with her dogs in the trade. Um, and this is a lab. The other person you have right now, Karen Shrimp and her dog, was from the town. You know, it doesn't have to be a purebred. They just have to have a personality. And that can be assessed by the person who does the training from the conservation dog in Hawaii. So, um, you know, right? So these are, this is our other, these are our two right now. These are only two. Um, Kim Rogers has done it too, but she's been seeing the job. But we have two, two, only two doing this right now. The more we have, the better it's going to be to find birds that we can't find. Uh, so that was a little bit more investment because you're going to invest time in training. And you have to do the volunteer as a bunch of some sort of walking person for a few months at least before you even start that training so that you understand what it is you're going for. But anybody who's got a dog and into something like that, it's really cool. And yeah. super rough. And Deborah, mm -hmm. one of the ways that came to be is that when Princess Aware is going on, she kind of like, hey, could we do this? It seems like a good thing that we could do at, at on a lake. And she really worked alongside with Val Stan and really led the way all the way, you know, prepared that program all the way from the idea of it to it coming into fruition. So passionate, passionate volunteer who also isn't here today. She's not feeling well, but she, um, oh my gosh, I can't even say it, but I'm pretty sure there's 20 humans in the body right there. All of us. That they didn't hurt the dog get their 200 hours. Yeah, we get hours for our volunteers. So we, you know, keep track of your hours and we award you things along the way. Her dogs both have their hours, and I'm not going to not get the dog with hours pin. They have a vet somewhere out there to identify them. So they're starting to collect their hours pins. All right, what you get? Your time, your energy, your sweat, because that's going to happen, I promise you. <laughs> Rear few pieces of AC, anyone that have a place. Um, yes, and the, and the work of your hands. So that, that's what we're looking for. And that time piece, it could be a weekly commitment to something or more than one thing. It could be, as I said, um, intermittent. You know, the weekly is ideal because there's between you know and then you're connected to the refuge. But whatever you can give, we're not going to take it. What you get, <laughs> uniform, black <laughs> and black t shirt. We're rocking them back there right now. We have, we've expanded to white variety drives it for the field workers, nice polos for the rovers, dark blue light blue um, hats. So, just so you know, but you need to be identified so that you, as a volunteer, when you're out of the refuge doing your roving interpretation. People know that they can go and ask questions. If you're in the field, like at Honolulu, which is not acceptable to the public, it really helps our Carol partners because they recognize the blue shirt or the blue hat, and they know, oh, I don't have to go kick another tourist out of the patches, you know, because it interrupts their work. So we want to make it easy for them. And then also for the public to know when a volunteer is at the edge of a Carol patch and they start walking with their camera, like, oh, excuse me, this area's off limits, and they have this, you know, popularity. So your uniform required, there's certain things, right? Close foot shoes, wear your uniform. Um, so you get that, <laughs> we can buy that. And then um, Nature Store comes briefly mentioned, but part of your perk is that you get a discount in the Nature Store. So it doesn't matter where you work, you could be, you know, schlepping through the field on a lake. Everybody gets the discount. It doesn't have to be the way of most people. Um, talked about this, you get into places, you know, you can get into um, the lighthouse at times. Um, you know, you just have to organize that with staff to be able to go inside at certain times or get into the refuge a little bit earlier um, than the public might. If you've got friends coming and you can't be there during the regular hours, you just work with us to, to um, be able to come out and visit at off hours. And then into places, the limit you're doing takes him to some pretty cool places. Um, you know, even if you're like a roving interpreter, right? You're not doing biological monitoring. We're trying to give opportunities, especially to our rovers, to be able to go up and go along with our biological monitoring team that goes up there so that they can better understand what's going on in the colony because they're 
you know, the guests are up there and they're looking over and rolling down to see what's going on when our rovers get to be up there and have an opportunity to go to the colony and help with the data collection, not a long-term commitment, but even a one-on. It's kind of a little bit rewarding to do it for a while. We try to um, try to kind of get that as a little reward to get up close and first to be on the cross. All right, so yeah. Helping plants, our birds, young to old, few to many, anything that you're doing is really helping. And then, um, so that's what you get. You get that good feeling, that half heart for contributing it all over. And then and we have plenty. the beer, at least. We have a um, volunteer fish cake top. <laughs> and we try to shower you with our love and appreciation, which happens every day with the in. But it's um, sometimes we're, you know, you're doing your thing and it's hard to really show how much we appreciate you on a day to day, even if we're saying it. But we really do try to um, have at least once a year um, at this point right now, have an appreciation uh, event where we can have fun, other volunteers can meet each other because maybe a Honolulu Bosch was a survey person and never met a rover. And, and just kind of build the family um, feeling, the you know, kind of feeling of our volunteers. Uh, in the past, I'm going to be honest, I feel like our program is so much more together with training and everything. I think it's our, right now, it's our lack of staff, but we, I feel like we're just doggy paddling or whatever, you know, <laughs> say blow up paddling, but they're way above the water. So doggy paddling with their heads above the water. So, you know, we, we want to at least be able to do this and recognition. We have your pins, we have special awards we give, lifetime achievement. A whole new award which is for people who, you know, maybe they don't do a lot of hours, but they've been coming for 20 years to do it. And we want to, we like to honor and just really um, show our appreciation for that as well. Okay. All right. And this is part of some of the things we've done in recent. Um, this was our last year's month. We did it at, uh, for the COVID time, we were doing it at the refuge. First, it was a drive by, get your bag, everybody has a mask. Here's your bag of goodies, high five. And, and then we had sort of a parking lot deal. We did it out at the point where you walk through and there was, you know, our little displays and you can walk through and see who won what. And, and then this past year, really bummed out that I've lost my what I was supposed to do. I might need to get to you. This past year we did it at the egg farm and like open space. We had it catered and it wasn't quite in the very before COVID. It was always a big party that was going on for, for many years at the uh, Hoopy Lot. So it would like show up and fancy schmancy, fun, you know, kind of buffet thing at Hoopy Lot. Long before that, it used to be up in the White House in the big time. Mm -hmm. And staff would cook and do all the things and all the other things. Anyway, um, you know, even if you try to, Margaret's leaving, was a little volunteer with us for so many years. So I made her a little gold sickle board and sent her on her way out to the main house. Yeah. And you know, this is somebody who would never want to trophy so this function. You can actually use this in your yard. Mm -hmm. It's a normal sickle for you. So the guy, you know, he used to like to take he was a rover out of the end, very, very aged and loved people. He would always offer to take pictures for me. And um, so we gave him a photo album. Yeah. So anyway, we try to make it fun. All right, so what do you need to do to volunteer? You know, first you're going to look and see are there jobs I want to do? You have job descriptions in the back. We can have a conversation with me about, you know, what do you think I could do? Where could I be? Um, when could I start? How do I do this? And then, so that's kind of it, figuring out what it is, what you want to do. And then we have a process of your, you have forms to fill out. Oh, it's a government. Um, <laughs> there's something called a volunteer service agreement form. It's basically a contract. That says you're you're almost like a fish and wildlife employee that gets no money. That's really what it is. So you're covered if you get injured on the job while you're volunteering, and you have an injury and you've got to go to the doctor. You'll go through the whole workers' comp thing. So here you would be um, covered by us. There's a, there's a process that you would go through the reporting. We've had it happen before already. So um, if you're injured, you go through the process. That'll support you. Then. Right, and then so you'll do your forms. If you're roaming a charter, or you're going to drive the cart to do habitat maintenance and load it up and unload your green waste, uh, you will fill out a motor vehicle form. It's 
super minor, very little for that one. You get your uniform. So you'll get your hat and you'll sign, and then you, you know, you'll get that checked out to you. And you'll get a handbook. If you're gonna look at the nursery, we'll get you the nursery manual. Um, and then training. So the training in the past, this is the place where I feel like really if somebody falling down is in the training in the past, there was usually and has been in different ways, but like a six-week kind of course where you would learn about the wildlife and these other things that are very organized. And it is definitely the North Star for shooting work. Mm -hmm. And um, didn't be that hard, but it does seem to be um, that we're going to be back on that. But meanwhile, there's a handbook, there are some other resources, you've got other volunteers to learn from and be mentored by. And so you've got your paperwork, you've got your uniform, you've got your job. Now you go do. <laughs> That's the most fun part of all of it is you go and you do you grab your rate and you know. We set up a schedule, we know when you're coming, if you're somebody who's going to be adopting a spot to habitat management, if you can't come every week, we just stay in communication and, you know, we do the best we can and we, we really try to customize it for you the best we can and we understand. Um, yeah, grab your current button. Um, one of the things that's super important for us in the past, up until, I guess this is the third year we're doing it, uh, Volunteers would come in, they would sign in the refuge at the office, whether it was Honolulu or Kilauea Point, sign in on a sheet, pay for hours, I work this time and this time, those might get lost, forgot to sign in, then COVID came and you weren't even signed in anywhere. Um, and our desire and need for your hours is one, first and foremost, from my perspective, is that we really want to honor you. But if you're like me and I volunteer, I don't care if I get out here, I'm just doing it because I want to do it, right? So a lot of people say that. Not recognition, fine. So, so if that's not part of your motivation, a lot of the other part of you that your hours go into and they get reported up to the national level. And then and your hours that get reported, what's going on? Oh, um, mm -hmm. little mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, it's kind of volunteer, right? <laughs> um, that your hours get reported up the food chain. And it, what it translates for us is support from the federal government at the top, right, from DC. So it is, even if you don't care about recognition, you don't want to be, you're just doing it. And maybe it's a little bit of a hassle to keep track on a calendar and put it into this little Microsoft form. Uh, for us, it's super important. It's how we come up with those numbers, 5,500 hours. And those are really important statistics that we look at. And then this, right now, um, it's basically a Microsoft form. You scan a code every time you work. It's super simple. It's like five questions that you're going to answer. You're putting in your name, first name, last name, date you worked, uh, how many hours you worked, which refuge, and what your job was. And the job descriptions when you come on board will go over what those are. But there's just a few they have the four categories that it's going to be. So it's not even difficult. Um, my my goal really is that we move on to a better, we don't have a good volunteer management sort of admin system, you know, getting you an account right now. The hitch of the giddy up is that you can't check your hours that you did. So I always tell volunteers keep a calendar, whether it's paper or digital, keep track of what you do. You don't have to do this right after you do the work, you can do it, you know. But a week, if you're doing three things that week, just sit down and do them together if you want. But there's no way for you to go back and look what you did. So um, next level is going to be that you would be able to have a system where you get the kind of, you put it in, oops, I forgot one, or oops, I put it in twice, and then you go and fix it. So we're getting there, hopefully. Okay. All right. It's not the end, it's the beginning. <laughs> Nobody's going to come up and say, so this is the end. Beginning, right? And my part the beginning. So I think I'd like to do question and answer, but really what I first want to do is introduce. So my current volunteer who came to support and wonderfully wore there. If you're already a volunteer, could you stand up? Not just raise your hand, but stand up. <laughs> Sorry, you don't have to stand up, you know, you your thing I know that. All right. And then Thomas, do you volunteer? <laughs> Julie, you're not current, but you're a volunteer. Good too. You do well, watch. Look at all these people, right? Paula, yeah. 
And um, if you have questions for any of them, so let's start. You guys are not volunteers. Do you have any questions? No? About? Just, you didn't stand up. You don't need your shirt on. But Debbie, you're a volunteer too. So I guess we have just a few people. Are you guys interested? Is that what you came for? To, you know? Okay. All right. Um, oh, I didn't talk about the Holly Beautiful. Let me back up. Let me make a slide for that one. Um, oh, so this is the other thing I wanted to say. I have this thing right here. This is when you're, uh, you can't see it from the other hand. You'll see the thing that's important. Um, when you're volunteering, you're volunteering for the financial National Wildlife Refuge Complex, but you might be on a refuge, right? On the lake, under the complex, under the refuge system, under region one, fish and wildlife, it's like there's a school. Your boss technically is the president of the United States, right? <laughs> Wait, that's really. But in my mind, these are our bosses. You know, they don't speak English, <laughs> but they're who we're doing it for. It's kind of who we're accountable to. Not to go into the whole thing, right? Like admin government thing, but but it's the wildlife that we're looking for. We're looking for and we'll do it and have that. So, um, yeah. There's one more if you would like the seabirds. Hey, so these are eleven birds, right? So everybody on there threatened, endangered, 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 and Oku'u that's a native, we need a threatened or endangered, and it's indigenous. So this bird genetically is the same as its relatives on the native. So that's the difference between the indigenous and the endemic birds. All these ones are endemic. Only found in Hawaii. Um, you'll find that at Slimbridge Waterfall Center in England, but not because it lives there. Other than it got taken there for for um, captive rearing, and they've got quite a flock there. So you might see, you might go somewhere on the mainland and see a name, but why? Not? That's because it's from there. All right. And then there's beavers. But it's missing in England there. So yeah. So we got we got a couple of. Um, those guys out there. So these are the seabirds, and we're also missing for another one. Yeah. And yeah, pretty good. Uh, let's see. So then we have the Newell's Shearwater. So that's a bird. So this is the other thing away point. And that's why I said I'm not going to talk about the refugees. We're here to talk about volunteering. But um, we have two species right now the Ao, um, or the Newell's Shearwater, and the Hawaiian Petrel, which is Kuau. Uh, they, there's been years of trying to restore those populations up, right? The um, what was endangered and the hawk is threatened species, but really it should be on the endangered species list. Um, and because its numbers dropped dramatically after Hurricane Anniki, pretty much, yeah, none of them used to be. So there is a translocation project going on over on the Nikoku, which gets you called crater, better known as Crater Hill. Uh, and there's a whole fence site. So there's a fence within there that was a predator exclusion fence, right? It was designed to protect the um, newels and the wine petrol and bring birds from the mountains in there. There's chicks that, you know, the scientists would feed and make sure they fled. And this is a whole journey of trying to establish a colony. Much more um, sophisticated and complex than just putting out an albatross that we must call. These guys be much more than that because those albatross are flying over there. So there's a whole mix and very intense programs going on and a big predator exclusion for us to keep things out. And that was kind of a tester. That fence in that home is in the process of rimming the whole refuge, that kind of a fence. Mm -hmm. So we are super excited mm -hmm. because of potential. This year we lost 60 some odd nets on Crater Hill the case. Another weird thing is pigs never used to be a thing in the late 80s and early 90s. Rare thing to have a pig on the refuge, and now they've become entrenched up there. Super damaging and destructive. They kill shearwaters and many of the ground nesting birds up there. So that fence, now that it's in, there'll be intense trapping to get predators, um, land predators out. They'll never keep an owl on the farm themselves, but it'll drastically reduce and the success of seabirds out there. Super important coming out at a time with climate change and rising sea levels, where places like Turn Island and Midway are going to end up underwater eventually as sea levels rise. Those birds need to have a place to go. So these high refugia areas are what Kilauea Point is 
going to be super, super critical space for it. anything that's high, especially, is going to be a really important place for these birds because they're not going to have any worry about them. You can't nest. Although they would like to be able to nest on the water, they are all adapted supremely for being at sea. The one thing they can do is lay their head on the water. So they're going to need our, our, um, go away for a while and come and have the other ones. Um, and that we get weird stuff and cool stuff in, like chromatic petrol from off New Zealand and everything. Yesterday, a magnificent, we've probably been here for a little while, a magnificent frigate bird. And those are off like central, far from not normal to be up here. And, uh, white turns on Saturday, which they don't go off with a pretty um, abundant over there, but they're, they're not usually aren't seen in the water. So things are mixing around in the world of wildlife, and we want to be agile. And that fence line is going to need um, biomonitoring, so it'll be worked to track the wildlife, but also. A lot of habitat management. So right now, our um, main uh, maintenance habitat guy, Stephen, is working with some detailees from the Maine and Fish and Wildlife to try to come up with a strategy to manage. I don't know how many thousands of feet it is of fence line. But if we go back to, is this going to circle back in the beginning or do I go back? Um, you probably not in the beginning. I'm going to show you. How many feet of fence line we're going to be having to manage? So this is another super important job that's coming on, and it's going to be. So I don't know if you can see it. You see all this? Sit. That's all a very high tech fence going on there. It's, it's going to be a huge shock to manage that. We're all aware of that. And in the ideal world, you say, "All right, let's make a plan." This is we're going to put a fence in, and then this is how many people we're going to need, and here's what we're going to need. But the importance of getting that fence in over getting the details sorted out before you build it are just not, it's it's just not realistic to wait until you have everything figured out, because you'll never have anything, everything figured out. So it's up now, it's doing its job, the hunting will be happening inside there for um, introduced predators, and we're hoping that we get volunteers on board to help with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that. There we go. That. Okay. You want to talk viewpoint? Yes, viewpoint. So the viewpoint job, um, that one's going to be kind of this mix of roving interpretation. So you're going to be out there. There's not going to be a golf cart to drive. It'll be three hour shifts. So it's probably going to be like, um, I think it's going to be a nine to noon and then a noon to three. That, right, yeah, three hour shifts. Uh, and we're going to be open actually Tuesday through Friday or Saturday, but the Tuesdays, right now, the thought is that the, um, we're not open to the public uh, at Kilauea Point. So the Rangers, Fish and Wildlife Rangers, might be covering the Tuesdays. So we're looking for Wednesday through Saturday or Wednesday through Friday. I'm not sure it's fully decided yet. So it's two hour shifts a day. So the viewpoint only may open until three. I think that's the plan. Until, unless, it's another place where we've got a gate that closes and opens, but we have no idea what's going to happen with the public. At Kilauea Point, you kind of have to go be going there, and we do get trespassers into that place. They climb the gate, no, you know. But it's going to be a bigger issue here, I think. It's right on the highway. It's going to look like, well, I just want to see in there. So this is another one where we're going to kind of figure it out. As we go along, we certainly can't afford to have staff out there. We're like broke, it's got you know, we're very few people. Uh, Kupu interns will probably be helping with that too. So maybe if there's an extended time. So, right now, the intent for getting volunteers is for four days a week and then two shifts a day, um, the morning and then the afternoon one. Okay. And like I said, no, and then that what that pink cards can go in there. Definitely. Parking spaces? Yeah, parking spaces. That's a good question. I think it's, it's quite a bit. I think it's 10, 20, maybe at least 20. No, I think about 25. Yeah, 20, 25. There was like going to be a bus parking because the shuttle was going to be dropping. But that's the state and the county are all on hold on that. So there's kind of a big parking that was supposed to be just for buses, but cars are So there'll be a staff person up there telling people that it's full when you can't come in. No staff person, it'll it'll be maybe either open automatically in the timer, 
It's going to be a self-guided. There's going to be a bathroom, but it's not no no running water. So it's okay. like a kind of a fancy pit toilet. Okay. And the volunteers would then just be there to answer questions, maybe have a scope, make things out. And, and then when you're not busy with the public, the idea is that they would be willing to do some weeding and pulling, you know, pulling weeds, because right now it's pretty easy to get the weeds out where they are. And if we can keep up with that, that would be good. There's a lot of energy went into planting some islands, uh, parking on native plants. And so it, that would be kind of a mixed job of doing that, a bit of weeding, and then maybe tidying the bathroom area. There's not trash cans. There's maybe a little one in the, in the toilet area, just in case somebody has to put you know, sanitary stuff in or something. But it, it really, there's no running water, as I said. So it's really gonna be just, you know, Hopefully, you know, paper isn't flying out the door and just a little bit of just, you know, just tightening up that piece a little bit. Is there a limit to the number of people in there at any one time? I don't know that anybody's going to be able to manage that. You know, what's going to happen is that there's not going to be a parking spot. And so they'll either park where they probably shouldn't or they'll drive out and kind of up there. If you can't pull in on the highway, then you just carry, you know, you drive on. Um, I kind of don't anticipate, I kind of think at the beginning, maybe, especially when the locals are, I want to go see, I want to go see, I've been waiting for it, but because people are traveling, you know, back and forth, if it looks busy, they might go, oh, I'll catch it on my way back, or, I know, but none of us, honestly, I don't know that anybody really knows what's, what's going to happen with the open gates. What's the reservation count at the lighthouse? They count how many people can can go in in a in a period. Yeah. Oh, and that's completely different because our parking situation right. is completely different there. But it depends on the time. Like when we set our, we might have forty six reservation slots um, <laughs> open, like at ten o'clock, and then at ten thirty we have to stagger it, right? Because they're limited to forty five minutes. These guys aren't going to be limited to anything. You're going to go in and take a nap on the lawn if you want to. You know, and there's not going to be any any. It's it's going to be nothing like Kilauea Point in terms of managing. Um, the guests there. It's free. There's no cost to get in. There's beautiful signage in there. It's going to be really, really a cool place. A great view has been carved out to look down. And yeah, I think it's going to be really special. So will there be picnicking? Mm -hmm. so, well, we're not going to be set up for picnicking, but I don't know that there's going to be a way to, I think the ideal would be that people would eat there, but I don't think we're going to be able to. It's a good question. I'm not sure if that detail has come yet, but um, that we're going to be able to say you can't do that. The other thing about that place is that you're not at Kilauea Point. You're right in there with the birds, right? So picnicking is not good because you're you're dropping food and then it goes to the raft and the raft goes to the ground. Up inside there, there's nobody nesting. There's nobody. You know, there, you don't have native wildlife habitat. I mean, I know there's birds on the trees and stuff, but uh, you don't have nene. I mean, they might show up, but they really haven't been inside there. Yeah, they, they may show up eventually, but they're really not regularly in there. Yeah, so I think it's going to be another one of those things where it's so new that we'll be, you know, being agile and shift to the need and really make it, um, you know, manage it as best we can and we'll find out. So we'll, know, we'll get a counter, keep track of cars, respond to an issue, and then we'll know that there's a problem because something's come up or something's recorded and our volunteers will be there. So that's helpful because, yeah. How many volunteers do you find that have like, Well, that you feel is a limit, you know, more better. Like, yeah, I think, you know, as Kilauea Point, the ideal is the two because when somebody's running the cart, you always have somebody out at the end and that's a big, big area. Um, at the viewpoint, I think we can do fine with one. But if we had such an overwhelming need that um, or, or desire, like, well, I don't want to do that. We have 20 people who want to volunteer. There'd be no reason to double up. But I think we just don't know. I mean, you might get bored. You might be there for two hours and you get three people in. But this is why we're going to have the habitat management piece of that in there, too, where you're going to go ahead and do some weeding and, you know, just care. Maybe it's going to be planting. Maybe there's going to be a time where you need some outplanting done of it. So that's that's the idea. And all this is just the idea that we have in our head. <laughs> and reality will probably help us adjust our sales to whatever the winds are. Do you have any idea how large the space is on the How large it is? Yeah, the, the lookout. I mean, is it 
possible for the a rover to just be walking oh, totally. around the area yeah. and yeah. like the yeah. point. Because there's signs. So the way it is is you drive in, you park, there's a bathroom, you'll see that right away. And the viewpoint as you come around, it's designed with like a wall to go around, and there's like, you know, a kind of fake lava wall. And you're looking down to this beautiful, beautiful viewpoint here, but there's signs along the way. So it's not like everybody's going to funnel to the only one thing there. There'll be interpretive signs. And so people will be able to wander a bit. But I can't imagine anybody really wanting to stay unless they just want to take a nap or they're going to, you know, a picnic thing. And we haven't clearly decided about the picnic thing, how that's going to be managed yet. But um, really, I can't imagine much more than a half hour because it's not like a ton to do. It's like, oh, wait, point you far. But I get, well, you're limited to 45 minutes now anyway. But if you could stay, but you're going to borrow binoculars and you, you know, you're, there's lots of buildings and shopping and things. And this just doesn't. Will there be slopes up there? Well, I, I, we're not going to have them mounted there as far as I know right now. Might be a future thing, but I would definitely like to have volunteers be able to pull one out of the back closet. And yeah, yeah. I think the one for me, the one, um, shortfall right now for that place that we need to work out is if there really isn't shade, much shade. There isn't a building to go well, to to get out of the weather. It's huge. And I never, I don't understand. And I think, yeah. So it might be, you know, umbrellas for the volunteers or, a, you know, the pop-up was suggested, but that means somebody trying to put up a pop-up every day. And that's like, it's a lot. If it gets windy, you're trying to manage that. So I think it's going to be have an umbrella as volunteer, have an umbrella and you need to know. Yeah. And you guys will inform us, you know, you're, you're going to be up there and staff will be doing this too on Tuesday. So we're all going to learn. And um, Is there a place to sit down up there or is it? I mean, yeah, you, you can sit. Yeah, there's something to sit on. Um, there's one. Yeah, there's one sort of concrete. But there's not a lot of sitting around. You can sit on the ground. You can kind of sit on a low wall. So it really, it really wasn't designed to have, you know, stay here a long time and hang out. It's designed to kind of be interpreted that way. But for the volunteers, you know, we can or have a chair that can be pulled out and maybe scones and yeah. There's an instant change. Yeah. You know, so you can move move to where you want to go to get in shade. Yeah. And we're I think we'll be okay to be able to test out, you know, try things, do things, and see how it's going to is, is there anything that they take away from there? A stamp, you know, a sticker or you know, that's a I was there. Yeah. So right now we are having new stamps made. So we could consider having a volunteer that it wouldn't be just leave it out because it'll disappear. So that could be part of the kit. You know how we were before running kits up and down during COVID for kind of point. The volunteers could have a kit that staff because the storage space is quite small in the back behind the bathroom, but there could be a little kit there that yeah. has the scope, a tripod, a stamp thing, and if they have their their book, but, but a lot of times they'll go into the bookstore at Kilaway Point and get it. You know, but if they don't, if they're not going to kill away fully, it would be great to have that stand there. So mm -hmm. that's a really good suggestion. I'll put that on the list of needs. Yeah, because that they can take and say, see, I was there. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd love to hear from you guys for our folks who haven't volunteered before. And I, I do want to be respectful of people's time because it's getting to close to 4 30. But let's, um, I guess I would want to start with if you have any questions offhand. Or what you were thinking about, you might want to do. Do you live here full time? I do. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And so, are you? Are is this the first time this opportunity is coming on your radar? Or are you... All right. I'll be in touch with you. Awesome. Thank you. It's good to meet you in person. Thank you. Um. Now, how about you? You. Yeah. And do you have any questions maybe for our volunteers in the back? Like just, you know, how they like it, how they've been as horrible, you know. <laughs> Wrong answer, Tana. <laughs> but that's what keeps you going back. 
is you gotta find the humor and what you're doing that you're enjoying it. And that's really important. Yeah. And I'm working very hard. I mean, I'm not gonna such people working out. I you know she's been out here in the hot sun at the end with her power pool and like sweating and you know you can pick as much time as you want, but I'm sure you know you come out of there dirty hot and you know, and maybe you've been at the point roving and you had a difficult person, you know, that's a personality thing, right? You need to know what you like to do when you're at the point roving. You want to be a person who's good with people and, you know, really happy to be engaged with them. And stuff. So, yeah. And we can have that conversation. I'm happy to have that conversation with you. We sit down and kind of feel it out. If you're not sure where you fit, we can work that out together for sure. I think it's interesting how the volunteer can actually be a source of information for the staff, people who don't have the time to have eyes on the ground for everything. I'm just thinking about the weeds, uh, who does a lot of what we go with the albatross. And how you know this two years ago that there was a whole class there and there was some of the run of the Yeah. We would never have known that if people, if she wasn't up on her head looking at yeah, I was talking like, why does this bird have a yellow fan? Yeah. And he's been back three years now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that kind of information is like the great cool question why is he here? Why did he come? And all of a sudden, we're going to start seeing more albatross coming from Newman, who are fans on Newman. And then we start, I mean, that's why no one came here. Why did that one not go back to where she was born? Why did she come to Bristol? And if we don't have eyes, even yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and I have another critical love is that you've got out there, or we, especially you, because she's out on right at home, right. Leia, where the pigs are, is reporting back in. And, oh, I've got you know five dead shearwaters, looks like pig traps. And then she worked with Let's Off Now, Pacific Rim Now, and they can focus their hunting. So, you know, the boots on the ground, mm -hmm. like that's really the more people who are trained to know what they're doing up there that can feed in information, the better we can respond and manage. Um, are you going to take that? I, I think those birds are here for the same reason we are. It's better here. <laughs> it's a good place to be. Yes. Yeah. Kathleen? Yeah. Yeah. Um, a while ago, you had a position available for a volunteer coordinator. Yeah. Are there behind the scene responsibilities that yeah, hundred percent. I think I, I do have that on the sheet back there, but I didn't have it on here. Um, and actually, our friends group and their and unending support were um, ready and willing. And we had actually a person, top time person, hired to do that because it's easier to know that you've got this if we can. And the and the friends group was willing to fund it. And at the very last, she kind of fell through. So that all just sort of fell through. Right, not too long ago, I guess she was going to start or something. A month or two ago, yeah. yeah. Starting now. So now, um, in the midst of everything else, we're kind of regrouping on that. So, yes, there's always been the need for that help. In a, and, in a volunteer position? Yes, absolutely. 100%. Yeah. And then that kind of volunteer would be getting into our files, which is fine. We would go through like a um, kind of a security process, you know, of your. You, you get like that security clearance and you get a PIP card and you would have access into. And there might be things to do that aren't quite that level too, which is why we were talking about doing it as a job position too. That would be a little more involved. But but we're working. So if you're still interested in doing it, too, right. I'm seeing we'll work out what you can do without that level. There's probably totally things that you could be helping with. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. Yes. Do have time that we want to ask Absolutely. You're my only one, I think, unless you want to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We can chat. Sure. I had time for that. If you're okay, I'll see these guys will be taking care of. There you go. Yeah, I really want to thank. Like, I just look out and this, it really is like a, a family of volunteers. Even though everybody doesn't see each other, if you work at Killaway Point, Tennessee, especially if you're rogue, get to know. But eventually, at some point, there's an intersection. The newsletter that the Friends Group puts out is just invaluable. So even if you're not coming on as a volunteer, you can totally sign up to receive that because it's the Friends Group newsletter. But Thomas is always tapped into what's going on with the 
I just have not had time. When I first came on, I'm like, there's three, five page long newsletters, and, and it's just, it's so much. So funny. And since Thomas is doing such a funny good job, <laughs> so yeah, even if you leave today and you're not um, you know, you're not gonna volunteer, you're not sure, still sign up for that newsletter because that'll surely inspire you some more. Mm -hmm. Right. Anyway, so thank you all. I thank you. Lovely to vote volunteers. What's that? Thank you, folks online. They're, they're out there. Yes, thank you, everybody. Who, I have no idea who's out there watching, <laughs> but um, welcome. If you are interested and you want to get in touch with me, um, I can give you my work cell number right now. Grab a pen and a piece of paper. <laughs> okay, I'm going to check and do that. I'll um, check too. Okay, that's not crazy to do that, then you can find it there. I'm going to give you two things. You can add the um, email to the chat. Um, and the, um, yeah, so my work's out, 808-278-8650. And my work schedule is Tuesday through Saturdays. So if you text me on a Monday, I may not see that till a Tuesday. And if you text me on a Tuesday and it's Wednesday opening time, you just be patient. If I don't get back to you that day or immediately and you're feeling like, I really want to answer. Just poke me again, drop it again. But I try to get through. I have two emails, and I try to get through those volunteers as dedicatedly as I can. But but there's a lot going on, and I wear their hats, so just be patient with me. <laughs> don't let that deter you. Like just don't and don't be afraid to you know bug me. Okay, I do the best I can to get back to the way. And it won't take long to board. Right now. You tell me what you want to do, we'll sign a form and we'll get you going and I'll start setting you up. We'll do an orientation. You know, the ideal is doing an orientation as a group, but it's just not happening that way. So I'm happy to do an orientation for whatever you want to do. If it's avian botulism training, that one is going to have to wait until we do a training because that's probably going to be maybe in the next month with other Kupu interns on, it's a little more involved. So it takes more time. So be patient about that. Meanwhile, you could buddy up with another existing um, avian botulist volunteer and go along and shadow even before you have a training. So even if you're not running out there on your own and you got trained, you can still get a feel. It's also a good way to get a feel of whether you want to do that or not. So if that's what you're interested in, let me know and I'll reach out to some of our avian botulist volunteers and see if they're willing to take um, take somebody on to shadow. Hey, I'll thank you. Uh, one feedback from the uh, chat before we yep. get on. Thank you very much for this very informative, much greater appreciation for all that goes into caring for these precious creatures. Looking forward to being able to volunteer in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm Jerry, and I Wait, do, do you get to say a name? I'm just one. Thank you, however that was. <laughs> <laughs> They've actually logged off now, so we all right. you. All right. Yeah. All right. And spread the word, even if you, you know, just Make sure that people know there's a flyer on the table out there. It says volunteer opportunity. If you're thinking of somebody, just grab it. It's got my email on it and phone number. You can take that sheet, take a few if you want, and hand them out and just have people reach out to me. I'm happy to happy to talk volunteering. I'll see you. Yes, we. Yes. She's one of our so our snowbirds come periodically, right? They're here for a few months and, and we have this like slim time right now where we can do is roving help. And then Debbie's here for I'm not sure how long time. Three months. All right. Okay. Thank you, Kathleen, for all you're doing. Thank you. And I'll come up and check out the birds. So yeah, I should have all those students. Thank you so much, Thomas. You're just like an amazing force to proceed. A force of nature, a force for nature. Yeah, you need help with the chairs. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you.